All right, and so I'm going to go ahead and provide just a little bit of an introduction and background to our speaker today. So our speaker today is Dr. Irene Astoris. She serves as medical director of the Integrative Medicine Program at the University of Florida. She completed her Integrative Medicine Fellowship at the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, the nationally recognized program of Dr. Andrew Weil as a Bravewell Fellow. She completed her physical medicine and rehabilitation residency training at the Sinai Hospital, Johns Hopkins Hospital, Interinstitutional Program, and PMNR. She received her initial acupuncture training at the University of Miami Center for Complementary and Integrative Medicine and has applied this to the management of musculoskeletal and neuropathic pain. She has worked at academic medical centers, federal hospital systems, and a community outreach clinic. To expand her skills as a physician leader, she completed an integrative healthcare leadership program at Duke University, and she is also a member of the American Academy of Medical Acupuncture, the American Society for Clinical Hypnosis, and a board member on the American Board of Integrative Medicine. So without further ado, I will go ahead and hand off today's presentation to our speaker, Dr. Astoris. Thank you very much, Natalie. Let you're me. welcome. I've ended my share, so go ahead and feel free to pull up your slides whenever you're ready to get started. All right, so let me get started um, and share my slide. And let me start from the beginning. So hello to everyone. I am grateful to be invited to speak about auricular therapy for chronic pain and delighted to be with this group. As Natalie mentioned, this is funded through the Florida Blue Foundation and the Florida Medical Malpractice Joint Underwriting Association, which has provided funding for this webinar series. Very excited about this um, support. And I am currently an associate professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and as previously mentioned, the director of the Integrative Medicine Program here. What was not mentioned and I'm happy to share with the group is that I'm also on the faculty of the Pain Trail Laboratory. So this is the Transitional Research Assessment and Intervention Laboratory of Dr. Of Dr. Kimberly Sibyl, who is a research professor in our department as well. She's a pain scientist and she and I share an interest in using lifestyle interventions such as nutrition, mind-body medicine, um, exercise, movement, meditation in chronic pain. Uh, so I, Natalie already kindly mentioned the rest of what I do, but, uh, but the heart of it really is I am a clinician who is interested in reducing suffering. So pain is one of the areas where we still need to make a dent in terms of pain reduction. So in my work as an integrative medicine physician and an acupuncturist, I have had, I've developed a particular interest in auricular acupuncture. So I'm happy to share what I know with this group. And as uh, Nicole mentioned, Natalie mentioned, um, there is, I've already started out with some slide, with some questions in the chat. So I'm turning the tables on you because I want to um, really engage you in this discussion. Um, in, I will also be turning off my video at certain points so that you can just focus on the slides, but I will turn it on, of course, so that you don't think that there is a disembodied voice talking to you through this presentation. All right, so this is what we are going to talk about today. We're going to define auricular therapy talk about its historical roots, uh, discuss the neurologic mechanisms for its analgesic benefits, and review the evidence base for the use of this modality using uh, in, in human trials. And from that, I really would like to engage you in a discussion on how we can apply an evidence base that is admittedly small, but needs to be developed for both uh, research and clinical applications. So, okay, 
Have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered why we have external ears? Well, for most of you, probably you remember your science class and you remember that you were told that it is to amplify sounds. But the interesting thing to me is, why is it that we have those peculiar folds in our ear? And so I looked it up because I'm probably like most of you, a science nerd. And it turns out that most of those twists and folds are arranged in such a way that they specifically enhance sounds with a pitch that is typical for the human voice, which is the sound that we care about. And they enhance these sounds up to 100 times and leave other pitches untouched. So the ear is fascinating not just as a sound collection device. And I came to know that as I continued practicing in this field. But you may just want to file that factoid in your file for future conversations. The ear is also um, something called, is, is also a microsystem. So this is something similar to um, the homunculus in the brain. And there are also some other microsystems in the body that is used in acupuncture, such as the scalp and the hand. So what you see here is a map um, that was one of the maps actually developed by Dr. Paul Nogier, who is considered the father of French style auricular therapy. So I will talk about the process of how this map was developed later in this presentation. It turns out that the ear is also richly innervated by several nerves. The concha of the ear, and I hope that you can, it's, it's I'm going to use my pointer, hopefully it works. So is it working? Can somebody tell me if you can see the pointer moving? Yes, you can see it. Okay. So this is called the concha of the ear. And this is, part, this is innervated by the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, as we can see from this drawing. But you can also see that it is innervated by several other nerves. So that would be the auricular temporal nerve in red, blue, the lesser occipital nerve, and yellow, the auricular nerve. This, to me, provides a plausible mechanism for the effects of auricular therapy, and not just for analgesia. In fact, um, there you, will, you may come across uh, information about what's called transcutaneous auricular vagus nerve stimulation, which is not strictly an acupuncture technique, but it is something that utilizes the vagus nerve. It is an FDA-approved therapy for epilepsy, refractory depression, and obesity, but not for chronic pain. And it is also explored, being explored to enhance cognitive and social functioning. So to me, who was primarily trained in Western medicine, but also wanted to um, sort of bridge what I know in Western medicine and what I was being taught in Eastern medicine, this helped me really understand that yes, there is a possible mechanism for auricular therapy that is worth exploring. So what is auricular therapy? So this is an umbrella term. It is an umbrella term, an umbrella definition that includes different techniques that is used to stimulate the external ear. So this could be the acupuncture needle. Most of you are probably familiar with that an ear seed or metal pellets, which um, is called acupressure or even your finger. So let me turn on my video and show you an example. Um, you see this? So this is an example. I'll put this very close. So this is a retained intradermal needle. 
And we, I use this as part of auricular therapy. Um, some people, some auricular therapy uh, practitioners also use electrical stimulation to the, to the, applied to the needles at points in the ear. And some use lasers, la uh, low level lasers to auricular points in the ear. So auricular therapy is broader uh, and covers many modalities. So I have a question for the group. And now I want you to um, put your answers in the chat. And Natalie, you can just tell me what they write, OK? I'm not going to look at the chat right now so that I can stay on topic and, <laughs> and stay on time. OK, so let's look. Uh, OK, is this auricular therapy? What are the answers? Are, are, we have no coming in. Mm -hmm. And anyone Someone else? Someone else said, I think so, but I'm not quite sure. Uh huh. Anyone else? No one else right now. Oh, okay. yes, yes, potentially we have. Okay, so. Uh, let me stop here. So whoever answered no could, if you don't mind unmuting yourself, why do you think this is not auricular therapy? Uh, let me go. Oh, I, oh, I forgot. You can't talk. It's, it's just, okay. I, Rhonda, I've allowed you to speak if you want to go ahead and share. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, because it doesn't look like the same area that she had highlight lighted on the previous screen in which the was like the lower low is what looked like was the area for auricular therapy. Mm -hmm. oh, all right, thank you for that. How about the one who said uh, contrary? Or... Um, okay, so we have... Uh, Chris, if you don't mind speaking, if you're able to, if you have a mic on. Um, yes, because it, it applies some form of pressure and manipulation to the exterior surface of the ear. All right. Well, thank you for those comments. Oh, I, I, I bring this up because I am certain that some of you may have come across patients who ask you about date piercing. Because this is date piercing, and they some of the patients that I um, see ask me about this and migrates. So this is a photo showing uh, where the earring is placed, and some of them tell me this is is this ask me is this good for migrates? Uh, is that something that some of you have heard from your patients? Yes, no chat thing about oh, chat responses? No responses yet. So if anyone has been asked potentially about this as a migraine solution, just feel free to let us know. Okay. Someone said that they have a friend who says it often helps with migraines. Another person says they've never heard of this before, this type of piercing. Oh. All right, so for those who have never heard about this before, so date piercing um, was developed by a piercing and tattoo artist in California for a client who wanted this earring specifically placed in this location. So it acts as a gateway to enhancing knowledge, which is called dot in Hebrew, hence the name became date piercing. If you look at it, it is in the area of the concha, which has some innervation from the vagal nerve, recall a few slides back. But this was really not developed for a therapeutic purpose. It was developed for a cosmetic purpose. And there was probably some incidental report from people who got it that their migraines got better. So interestingly, this has been looked at and studied. And if you look at this, so this is from a case report of this group. And this again shows you the connections of the vagal nerve that could probably explain why it has helped some people with migraine headaches. 
So again, you see that ear is an ear of the 52 year old man who had intractable migraines. And you see the connections, not just from the vagus nerve, but also from the auricular, auriculotemporal nerve that could possibly help migraine headaches. However, I have not come across rigor, more rigorous data that goes further than case reports or anecdotes. So when my patients ask me, would, you, would I advise them to get a date piercing for their migraines? My answer is we, I don't have enough data to recommend that they do that. So I hope that was helpful to answer that question for, the, for this group. Okay, so let's move on to the historical roots of auricular therapy. I bring this up because it provides a strong example of how cross-pollination of ideas, East and West, and respect for each other's traditions can provide a fertile environment for growth. So we know that acupuncture has this rich history in Asia, particularly in China. The photo that you see on the right is something from the Yellow Emperor text, which is considered the classic text for acupuncture. And indeed, the ear has points that are part of the meridians in classic acupuncture. And most of those points are considered meeting points of those meridians. But if, so the question is, how did this tradition develop in the West? in particularly in Europe and in France. So you can see a portion of the map of France on the right side, and you can see this area, Marseille. So Marseille is a port city. So you can probably imagine that this was a rich marketplace, not just of goods, but of ideas as well. So in 1951, there was a French physician, his name was Paul Nogier. And he noticed that for some of his patients, there was a scar on the ear, the outer, and I'll show it to you later, in the outer tubercle of the ear. And some of his patients, so he started to ask them, you know, how did that come about? And it turns out that there was a local folk healer, a woman named Madame Barin, and she would cauterize that area for her patients who had problems with low back pain. And it would take care of their low back pain. So that got Dr. Nogier interested. And so he started to see if there was really a correspondence between tenderness in that part of the ear to people for people with low back pain. And that was the first point that he identified, which was the lumbar spine point. And he started from there to build his map. And what you probably are familiar with is the map where it shows the inverted fetus. Uh, and that is a representation that developed out of that you know, the, um, investigation of different points. So if that point was sensitive, did it correlate with something wrong with the body? And he has since refined those maps. And there are many maps both from Nogier's tradition, and there are also maps from the Eastern, the Chinese tradition. So actually when Natalie asked me uh, what would be a nice thing to give to the participants and she suggested some of the ear charts, I told her that, yeah, maybe this is good, but there are just so many ear charts. But the way that it was developed was th through that process. And interestingly, Dr. Nogier, published his work in an article, a German journal. This story gets better. I love stories. So please, um, please indulge me. Uh, a German publication that was circulated in China. And the Chinese acupuncturists saw it. And they started to build on that too. So that, you know, long story short, coming to this day and age, the acupuncturists from China recognize French auricular therapy as part of the acupuncture tradition. So 
some of the um, acupuncturists that I work with here use the um, French style. So that's called French style auricular therapy. That's Nogier, where they use those um, specific point identification instead of the maps that was developed in China. Um, so let me just show you just quickly a summary of how this compares to each other. So in the Asian system, the Chinese system, there's a meridian system. Some of them, some of the points are in the ear um, and there are meeting points, as I mentioned earlier. In the French style, these were determined using specific techniques. Um, so initially just a point, they stimulate it. And if it was painful or tender, that is a point that correlates with a certain part of the body. And later on, they developed more techniques to, de to identify those points using electrical resistance and what they call a vascular autonomic signal. So my training in acupuncture was not using the French style. I was trained in acupuncture here in the US. So I learned about auricular therapy, mainly using those points in the um, meridian maps developed from the Chinese um, tradition. But I became interested in auricular therapy because I was a spinal cord injury physician and I became interested in neuropathic pain. And my patients who had a spinal cord injury had problems with not just weakness, but also spasticity and pain in their extremities and could not tolerate the periods where they would be lying down with needles in their bodies. So I said, hmm, the ear is very accessible. So why don't I find out if some auricular therapy protocol would help with neuropathic pain? And I met an um, acupuncturist who was trained in the French style. And that is another story that I will continue as we go through the presentation. So hopefully that gets you tuned in. So let's look at certain uh, pain conditions. And I want to focus on chronic pain because the universe of pain is so big. It will take more than an hour to go through that. So let's just look at chronic neck pain, cancer-related pain. We'll talk a bit about acute pain just very briefly because of the historical uh, historical relationship of uh, a protocol that I will discuss later, then headache and neuropathic pain. So um, the full citation is in the references, which is on the last slide. And what I'm going to do with this, as I mentioned to you, is look at uh, the evidence base in human trials, pointing out what are the strengths and weaknesses of each. So as you can see, this is a recent study. This is a group from Brazil, and they were trained in the French style of auricular therapy. So you have a small N, but the nice thing about this to me is that they looked at, their, at the outcome of their intervention four months and one month after the intervention was discontinued. So. I wanted to find out how sustained the pain reduction would be. So these were patients with chronic neck pain. So um, they used the neck disability index score as their filter. So those who had a score of greater than five, but no previous surgery, cancer or autoimmune disease. And they did the auricular therapy in the French style. So meaning they identify the points, although they had some basic points. And they did that for six weeks once a week, 20 minutes. And so using their outcome measures of the pain scores using the visual analog scale and the scores using the uh, neck disability index, we see that there is a significant reduction in the scores both at one month and at four months. So they did not use auricular therapy, they just used manual therapy. So this is another study and this is or acupressure. So I mentioned that sometimes um, needles, uh, sorry, and sometimes seeds or pellets can be used to stimulate those points. And this is a randomized study. So a bigger number of participants, still small, 
but the good thing is that it had a control group and they used acupressure with seeds. So these are ear seeds that could be metal or plant-based seeds. And in their case, they use plant-based seeds. They also look at the um, NDI, the Neck Disability Index and the VAS, but only for a short period of time. Their, their window was smaller, just two weeks. Again, they showed um, a reduction, but we can see that this certainly needs a longer window of observation for us to say that, yes, this would be helpful for me when I talk about this with my patients or recommend this to my patients with chronic pain. The next one is um, an older study, but this is a um, nice comparison between electric, electrical acupuncture and auricular acupuncture. So as we can see here, it's an, an N, the N is small. They used the French technique and they used um, three groups. One had electroacupuncture, one had manual acupuncture, and they evaluated them three months after a six, three months after a six week period of treatment. And at this, as what's obvious from the title of the study, uh, electroacupuncture was more effective than conventional acupuncture. So um, the next one I'm having a problem with my slide here. Advance it. Let me see. Here we go. The next was in is the next one is in the setting of chronic of um, cancer related pain. So some patients who receive chemotherapy have experienced different types of pain, some neuropathic pain, some musculoskeletal pain. So this was an older study from a French group. So Dr. Alimi and his group are trained in the French style of auricular therapy. And um, what they did was they divided their um, subjects into three groups and they used a specific type of needle. And I'm going to show that to you in the next slide. Um, and they use that needle at points where they determined using the low resistance an electrodermal signal. So they put that needle there. And then for the second group, which almost acted like a placebo, they put that needle at points where they did not detect the electrodermal signal. And then the third group, which also acted as their placebo group, was they just put seeds at, again at points where they did not detect an electrodermal signal. So this is how the needle looks like. It looks scary but it's actually a very tiny needle, so about this big, and it has a plunger. So this would be a plunger. And you just push that into that specific point in the ear, and that can stay there for about a week. With epidermal turnover, the needle actually can just fall off on its own, or it can be easily taken off you know, by twisting it and pulling it off. So this, ac this um, acupuncture needle, this ASP needle, was actually the needle that I learned to use from the French trained acupuncturist I told you about earlier. So what they found is that the ones who receive the ASP needle at the points where they were able to detect an electrodermal signal meaning the points where there was correlation with some, what was wrong in the, in the body, experienced a greater pain reduction, 36%. And the interesting thing is that they noted this two months after the treatment ended and the treatment was just two sessions. Um, so we can argue that this is um, old 2003, um, it's in a very specific group of patients. It needs to be replicated. So I 
So I was, I was curious too. So I had to find out, is there something newer that we can use for our patients with cancer related chronic pain? So this is from the group of Dr. Mao, who is an integrative medicine physician and acupuncturist at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And what they did was to compare the effectiveness of electroacupuncture or auricular acupuncture for patients with chronic musculoskeletal pain in their cancer survivor group. And that's the name of their trial. It's called PEACE because it means personalized electroacupuncture. So that was their comparator. Bigger N, 360. They were, had no evidence of disease at the time of their participation in the trial. And they had chronic musculoskeletal pain. So not neuropathic pain, an average of five years. They used the brief pain inventory and they only uh, took patients who had a score of greater than five. So one group, they received auricular acupuncture. It was a standard protocol called the battlefield acupuncture protocol. And I will describe that too later. And then the second group is personalized electroacupuncture. So this was body acupuncture. And this was something that uh, it was individualized for the participants based on what the acupuncturists would call pattern diagnosis. They would do the specific a diagnosis based on what they feel in the pulse or what they feel in the tongue. I know that one of our, our acupuncturists, David McMahon, previously presented to this group. I don't know if it's the same group, but you may want to view that recording. He will talk to you about what acupuncturists do so that uh, in their diagnosis that's different from what we do in, uh, I, I personally don't do as much pulse diagnosis and tongue diagnosis in my treatment. So, but in this group, they use that as the comparison. And the third was uh, strict usual care control. Interesting what they found in their, um, in their study. They actually found not, not, o not only minimal difference between the two groups, but actually um, they, did not, they did not achieve what they wanted as a clinically meaningful reduction in pain, which in, we feel would be at least two points, two points in terms of the BPI change. So uh, they only got 1.9 points reduction in the BPI score. So let's say if a patient came in with a BPI of, of eight, at the end of 12 weeks, their BPI score would not even go down to six. So that would not be considered clinically uh, meaningful. But close enough, close enough if you really want to just round it out for the electroacupuncture group. So it seems like there is still some benefit to finding out the specific point and not using a protocol. So I told you that I would discuss battlefield acupuncture. So recall that I mentioned um, that I was introduced to a French trained acupuncturist. So his name is Dr. Richard Nimzau. He's a retired uh, flight surgeon, Air Force flight surgeon who is an acupuncturist and he was trained in the French style of acupuncture. And he developed battlefield acupuncture, a protocol where he used, you can see this are how the ASP needles look like in the ear. So he used gold. So remember there was gold, stainless steel and titanium. And when I asked why gold, I think they have, it has something to do with the properties of the metal. Uh, it's not pure gold. Um, I'm sure that the, inside part is still some stainless steel or an alloy, but in, in auricular acupuncture and even in acupuncture, we believe that there is some effect or some effect of the metal used. Uh, so probably that's the reason why, but I've not really delved into it. So you can see these are standardized points. So that's the point. This is Shenmen. Shenmen is a commonly used 
point uh, for in acupuncture in it loosely translates to the gate of heaven and we use this to treat patients to in in acupuncture protocols for pain for anxiety for sleep and then this is another point called point zero you see that there and this point is an internal point you can see you cannot see it from the um outside but it's in there and then the last one is the cingulate gyrus so actually if i were to look at this i would say that this cingulate gyrus point is not in the proper position it should be there but this is the the, the thing you know we we have this question about where is the point where is the actual point and we have come to sort of terms with saying that maybe there is an acupoint zone, but the purist, the auricular therapy purist would really want us to define the point using some methods such as point stimulation or the others. I sometimes use point stimulation when I do my auricular therapy because it's not very cumbersome. We have a tool called a point stimulator that we use. So I showed you those points. It's the gold ASP needles. This was developed by Dr. Nimsa for acute pain. So I, this is why I brought acute pain up in the earlier slide. Acute pain for first responders. That's why it was called battlefield because these he felt were um, people who would, not who would not do their, would not be able to do their tasks well if they were sedated with some form of opioid. And there's lots of you know, literature that you can review on the efficacy of battlefield acupuncture. And I would say with all honesty that the data on efficacy is mixed. Interestingly, it seems like the data coming from an ED practice. So I do not know how many of you in the audience come from the, an ED work setting, um, how many of you are there. But most of the um, data that were showed some positive results came from the emergency room settings. So I would say that really uh, the acute application is probably the one that is most effective. Next, um, this is using acupressure. And this is interesting to me, not only because it is a recent uh, publication, but this is uh, for a group of patients with chronic low back pain. Most of that we see in the older population, certainly we see it in the younger population too, but most in the older population. And they use some form of mobile health. Of course, this, uh, the group of Dr. Ye is the primary, um, is, is, the, is the primary investigator. This came from her lab. She started her work when she was still at Hopkins and now she's at, in Texas. But really starting from nice, elegant um, preliminary studies and then opening, up, opening it up to larger trials and deploying it using mobile health. So they developed an, an app. So I guess what they're looking at is how to, how to make this a modality that is accessible for most patients. I think personally as an acupuncturist and a clinician, a, um, a physician, I feel this is important because acupuncture as a treatment modality is still not accessible to most of our patients because of insurance um, reimbursement. So I was interested in this. And I, I really wanted to uh, find out what has happened to the work that they were developing. So first they, the first phase of their project, they developed the app. In the second phase, um, they, they um, asked 30 subjects to use this app. So the average age of that group was 54 years old. 83% of them had low back pain. So some of them have pain from other sources, neck, headache, uh, arthritis, knee pain, and they used several measures. So the brief pain inventory, the um, global, the, the perceived global change, promise 29, pain catastrophizing scale, and 
uh, some disability questionnaires. And this is um, this is their app. Uh, the nice thing is that they're short. So at the start, so you, I, 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 if you see, there's the Shenman point, main point for pain relief. And this, this is the lumbar spine point. So, and this, so, so this is a short video. I think it was uh, uh, three minutes just to tell them, you know, why does this work? How can this work? So this is what the, the participants listen to. And then this is a video demonstrating how they apply it themselves. So they apply those um, pellets, those ear seeds themselves. This is what I, this is the point finder that I was telling you about. And so further, just telling them how, that's showing them how to put the Shenman point. And they actually also in their process checked, you know, how, how well their subjects really put these points, how accurate they were. It's, um, so the full citation is, as, as I said, at the end of the slides, and um, it is an open access article. So very interesting to me, and I hope that stimulates some interest in some of you too. And then this, this is the one I was telling you about. So we used uh, the battlefield, um, acupuncture protocol for patients with spinal cord injury related neuropathic pain. Again, small n, we used the protocol. We had a wait list control, did it for eight weeks. We just, we used the VAS primarily, although we also used the global impression of change. And we saw 36% reduction in VAS scores um, at eight weeks. So at four weeks and eight weeks, not as much at, at eight weeks as it was at four weeks. Um, so what I can say from all these studies is they are, they need to be replicated. They are small, they need to be replicated. Uh, I am most excited about the work from Dr. Ye on using auricular acupressure and a smartphone from the standpoint of access. So what can we do with this information? For me, this is why I want to be involved in discussions like this. As I said, clearly we need to replicate previous research and build on it, but also develop new research designs, looking at other settings. How can we use this in ED settings? How can we use this in group visits? Or how can we use um, auricular therapy together with a short, session of uh, self-hypnosis or a short session of just breathing exercises and see if a multimodal approach would be more effective for chronic pain management or not. But it, it, I really would like to see the research go in that direction. And as I already mentioned earlier, uh, we need to find ways to pursue reimbursement for this modality, but it's almost like a chicken and egg thing. The insurance companies would want to look at the data um, in order to move the needle. I can tell you though that I have hope because Medicare approved acupuncture for chronic low back pain, but that was only after so many years of research in the area and so much data. So I have hope. And then the last one is training and education. So I can tell you that in the VA, they have trained people just on the BFA, the battlefield acupuncture technique. So not a full acupuncture training. Acupuncture training takes a long time. When I did, uh, I mean, for traditional acupuncture, acupuncture training, that itself requires years of training and then practice. In my case, I did it after I already trained as a physician, was practicing as an MD, but I also had to um, spend a fair amount of time, two years, um, getting everything together, six months of the actual consecutive training initially through the Center for Alternative and Complementary Medicine at the University of Miami. It now goes by a different name, but it, even after that, I had to, to submit proof of the number of 
of um, procedures I've done, and then continuing medical education. There's actually board certification for medical acupuncture, which I did not pursue. So maybe the training is, obviously training is important, but I don't know if there would be a sweet spot so that we don't make the training requirements get in the way of getting this more widely accessible. So this is what I hope you take from this uh, session. Um, to know that auriculotherapy has roots in the East and West. The analgesic benefit is mediated primarily by the vagal system. We have small trials and we need to build this and see how we can utilize this non opioid alternative to chronic pain management. And as I said, these are the references and the slides are available to you. Most of them are open access. And with that, I end the session and open it up for discussion. And probably Natalie at this point has already looked at the chat. I have ignored that for now, uh, but sure, uh, if, if the audience is willing, I'd really be interested to find out. I mean, there are 12 of you on this um, presentation today. I mean, what, why are you interested in acupuncture? And, you know, if, what about acupuncture are you skeptical about? Or what do you want to learn more about acupuncture? How do you want to introduce this? Yes. To Thank you so much, Dr. Astores. We have a couple of questions that are coming in, but I do encourage, uh, like she's asking, if you have just questions, curiosities, or if you just want to share your interests, if you are already trying to set up or pursue something in a medical system or a clinic where you work, feel free to share that. We'd be happy to discuss that as well. Or if you're trying to pursue any research, we'd be happy to hear about that. But I'm going to go ahead and read off a couple of the questions that have been asked and then others be thinking about something you'd like to ask now is the time while we have the availability. So we have one from Teresa. Uh, does the Dave piercing affect the cardiac response of the vagus nerve? It has not been demonstrated as far as I know. Okay. Thank you. And then um, we had another question from Kim about are these therapies covered by insurance? So I think that's kind of a mixed answer to that. But if you can kind of share again, the overview of of coverage, at least for Medicaid or Medicare and anything else that you're aware of? I, so I already mentioned that Medicare covers acupuncture only for one condition, which is chronic low back pain. And there are many caveats to that. So they have this long checklist. It should not be due to a malignancy, uh, an autoimmune disease, all those things. But Medicare covers that. Now, there are other commercial insurances, for example, Blue Cross Blue Shield Federal, Blue Cross Blue Shield State cover acupuncture for other conditions. And these are conditions where we know, we have demonstrated that acupuncture is effective. So migraines is there, um, pol um, chemotherapy, nausea, and vomiting is, is listed there, neck pain. Uh, so they, a lot of them is both condi is condition specific. Um, and so what we do here when our patients are referred for acupuncture is we ask the patients to verify with their insurance companies and we also verify from our end. Okay. Um, yeah, that's definitely a great suggestion. I think when we've had this question come up before on prior acupuncture, just general related talks, we encourage people to call their insurance companies and talk with them about options that are available because it can be difficult to understand, you know, your plan, the language, or when you're discussing it with a patient, again, reminding them to ask that. And then acupuncturists, as they find people who are local in their area or maybe physicians who offer it, talk with them more in order to learn. They might not advertise what all payment options are available, but they have often some different structures that they can do depending on if it's a clinic or if it's within a health system. So I think that's very important. And uh, someone was just responding um, that their um, 84 year old mom had full coverage with Medicare and her supplemental Cigna. So again, it's just really something to encourage people to look into if they're able or if they have a caregiver maybe that you're working with so that you're able to get that information from insurance. And just a couple of other um, comments from people. We had uh, 
personal experience with uh, my mom's chronic back pain and she received tremendous relief. So I think that's great to hear. And another person just said they're interested because they don't respond well to medications and more traditional options. They would rather have something that's considered more natural and um, non-opioid alternatives are always a good thing that people are looking for. Another person, um, I'm interested in it as a possible self-management skill that could be offered alongside such things as self-hypnosis um, to those with chronic pain, fatigue, who can't tolerate or afford medications. So I think that that is something interesting definitely to look at. I don't know, Dr. Astores, if you're aware of any other studies going on in Gainesville that are kind of tying these things together on the UF side. So the use of acupuncture or auricular with other combined modalities. So we have, I am not aware of, you know, multimodal approaches in a, as a research a study at this point, but I would like to comment on what Chris just mentioned, because I think that, so what I like about what he said is self-management, because the key really in managing chronic pain is how can we help our patients successfully self-manage pain so that even though the pain is there, they are able to function or the pain is at a level that allows them to function. And there may be different self-management techniques. So an uh, example I gave earlier was using auricular acupressure. And self-hypnosis is fairly easy to learn. And the thing about it is that some people may prefer to use auricular acupuncture because it's the, actually for that I have um, I'm glad we had this time because for the auricular acupressure what the participants were asked to do is for the points that they placed on their ear they basically just had to press those points three times a day until they felt a little bit of warmth in in that area so that's to stimulate the point so if you really think about it, I don't know if we would have the same effect if we just did it with our fingers on those certain points. But anything that can help people increase their self-efficacy is very important when we work with a chronic pain population. So thank you for that comment, um, Chris. I hope that that generates a lot of other questions for the rest of the participants at today's session and for those who will be listening to the recording. Yes, and if anyone has anything else, again, feel free to use the chat feature or the Q&A, but just a reminder that um, my contact information is listed up here. So if there are other questions, or you think of something later, or you're just looking for maybe a resource, definitely feel free to reach out at something where we can connect you with. And everyone will again receive this recording and then the slide deck. So you have that list of references that has been shared throughout. And then we also want to encourage for those who are interested to attend our next provider friendly event. So again, this is for those really with a medical understanding of how to integrate this into practice, but we have a CBT event that's coming up in April. And so it says introduction for the family medicine provider, but really this is for any sort of clinician that just doesn't have access for referring patients to pain psychology. Uh, pain psych is not something that is available to all. It's not in all areas, it's not that widespread at this point. So it's something again, to kind of tie in an integrative modality and help you to use some things practically with your patients while you have the time with them in a typical office visit or within the emergency department even. So we appreciate that. And yes, slides will be shared. We have a couple of people asking about that and we appreciate your attention. But if, if there are no other questions, we'll let Dr. Astores go ahead and end this on any note that you'd like and then we'll conclude for today. So again, thank you very much for the invitation. I believe, as I mentioned during the talk that uh, cross-pollination of ideas uh, provides fertile ground for development. So I saw that uh, Juliana is a, an ED doc, so mm -hmm. I hope to connect with Dr. Henry Young over here at UF, the Gainesville campus, because he is very interested in using some form of auricular therapy 
to help patients who come to the ED with acute exacerbations of chronic pain because um, we, we, need, we need to continue the work in this area. So again, thank you. And I hope to, um, and please feel free, feel free to send me an email. I, Natalie has it, she showed it in the earlier slide because I would love to continue some form of collaboration, not just with me. Um, so the lab that I am part of, the research lab, the lab of Dr. Kimberly Sibyl would also be happy uh, to work with collaborators in the Jacksonville area. So again, thank you very much for your attention and your engagement. Thank Take you so much. Everyone uh, have a good rest of your day and thank you again for joining us.